Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Gleb Sapurski. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today with me is Ben Dutter, who's the Senior Vice President of Strategy at Power Digital. Ben, tell us a little bit about what Power Digital does. Yeah, for sure. And thanks for having me on, Dr. Gleb. Uh, Power Digital, we are a growth marketing firm. So we sit mm -hmm. kind of at the intersection between more traditional consulting firms and performance marketing agencies. So we like to blend both of those things to uh, grow our clients' revenue and, and profit as much as we can. Excellent. And tell me a little bit about what you see as the impact of artificial intelligence on growth marketing. Yeah, well, it's it's a massive impact, and there's many ways that we could uh, steer this conversation depending on your interest level there. But I think at a high level, there's kind of two main approaches. There's the efficiency approach where you're able to do things a lot more quickly or super productively compared to what you were able to do in years past or eras past. And then there's the quality side where you're able to create or ideate or interpret information and gives you more room to have more kind of headspace or more capabilities. And so that's empowering uh, brands to grow faster and to see a higher ROI. So both sort of feed into each other. Mm -hmm. um, but I think from a marketing lens for now, the short term definitely is in the speed and efficiency <laughs> and that frees up your critical thinkers to have more time. Excellent. So let's dive deep into that. What does it mean that it AI allows more speed and efficiency? How does that practically look like? Yeah, for sure. I think on the the paid media side, uh, so we're mm -hmm. talking about you know advertising, especially digital performance based advertising. We've been using machine learning, which is a type of AI, yeah. for algorithmic optimizations for probably close to you know a decade. It's been best practice by this point, and mm -hmm. those systems have been very well optimized over time. And so when I started way back when, um, we used to actually have to manually adjust all of our settings and bids and levers and things yeah. in an ad platform. If I'm bidding on a keyword, I actually had to type in the keyword. I had to put in how much money I'm willing to pay for that keyword. Now all of that's done with you know cloud infrastructure and AI. So yeah. the work that a paid marketing expert does is more consultative and business level and mm -hmm. understanding the kind of the impact as opposed to fiddling with individual bids and keywords and all of the programmatic ecosystem. So that's on the paid side, but there's also a lot of operational uh, input analysis. You can do mm -hmm. very quick and deep data science now with AI mm -hmm. um, and, and even create new ads. There's generative AI where you're able to yeah. create lots of new copy or lots of new landing pages mm -hmm. or whatever. So there's, there's almost infinite um, applications at this point. Let's go into the data science and the generative side, which are the newer activities. Tell me a little bit about some examples of how you use generative AI to create new content. Yeah, for sure. So the most, the easiest one that's the most prevalent right now certainly is text-based content. So you see mm -hmm. that a lot with writing copy, whether that's for an, mm -hmm. an email program or for ad copy um, or for landing page copy, things like that. So it's still not quite good enough yet, in my opinion, to completely replace a human. I think it will eventually and probably relatively soon, but a lot of it has been positioned where people now on the generative side are more prompt specialists and yeah. editors. So they kind of input, let the black box do its thing, see the output, edit it, maybe make some adjustments or make some tweaks to it. And that's more of the workflow. So that's become a significant efficiency booster for um, a school of work that was more technical and more um, mundane in kind of the way that the work stream was. On the the exciting side, though, I think it's more of the visual and, and audio yeah. and video type stuff, um, which is more difficult to fool a typical person, right? It's easier to have text-based sound competent and humanistic, but video generative AI video is still pretty uh, 
uncanny valley in a lot of ways. So I think a lot of that is more experimental and very narrow niche applications rather than super deep, like A to Z production of a video asset. Yeah, definitely. Can, it's much more mature in the tech space. So it's important for folks to understand that generative AI is at the worst right now, that the worst we'll ever see is right now, that it will only keep getting better. So there's very clear future there that video is going to keep getting better, text is going to keep getting better, and that human, the different skill sets will be valuable in the future. So what have you found about the kind of skill sets? So you mentioned that briefly. I want to go a little bit deeper to that in terms of working with generative AI. How are the skill sets differing from what they previously used to be? Yeah, I think, yeah, a lot of it is, it's similar, but the the application is different. So I'll give you an Mm -hmm. example. Um, If you're a graphic artist, a lot mm-hmm. of your time as a graphic artist or a designer is was historically spent using tools like a Photoshop or similar yeah. doing or an illustrator um, doing very precise, small movements and a lot of kind of eyeball testing, right? Where you would zoom out, you'd flip it back and forth, you'd flip it upside down, you'd look at it in lots of different colors and con- contexts. And a lot of it was based on the speed and the skill set that you had in applying your actual finger skill on a keyboard or a mouse or a tablet, right? And with generative AI and a lot of the tools, even, um, you know, Adobe's new generative AI system, a lot of that, again, it's still not as good as a true expert professional could do manually, but you can get 90% or 80% of the way there in Mm -hmm. minutes. And so a lot of those people who have that same skill set rather than being really reliant on making all those little fine tweaks within a program like Illustrator, they start off with an, a, you know, a, a generative AI composite image, and then they kind of just edit it or clean it up at that point. And so I think the skill set now has become more of a um, an amplifying effect rather than mm. a starting from, from scratch effect. And the creativity that can be generated where people say, you know, in times past, especially in a in an advertising or marketing context where you're often billed by a certain number of hours or a certain amount of deliverables, yeah. there was less risk taken historically at mm. brands to be able to spend an expensive art director and an expensive graphic artist's time mm-hmm. creating a lot of static imagery for hours and hours and hours, and maybe not even use that imagery. But now that same team could sort of explore whatever they want, even the more outlandish things Mm -hmm. and get to a near finished product that they can present to a client or to whoever their stakeholders are and more more quickly innovate in that space. So I think it is allowing for Mm -hmm. creativity to kind of blossom, even if perhaps you were not as manually dexterous as a more skilled artist was in times past. I think as the expert, kind of the marketing expert, your key value is going to be in creating, then evaluating the product that you're going to be, the AI is, it will take a very long, a while before the AI is good enough to evaluate the product, how how appropriate it is to the context, but it's definitely going to be important to be able to quickly create something evaluated. And that's the value that you're going to be providing to your client with the recommendations. What have you seen? So that's kind of my initial impressions. What have you seen about the value of using generative AI in that way for clients? Yeah, I think it comes down to uh, testing and a a more Mm. data-driven approach and iterative approach to what is working. Um, Mm -hmm. Just extending it off of like the ad copy example, you know, it used to take uh, many hours potentially if I wanted to do 5,000 ad copy variations across my Google and meta advertising, it would be, I would either have to write a formula in like a spreadsheet that would do it for me where I'm combining specific things, or I would have to use some kind of other dynamic fields or, you know, some kind of trigger to create that many ads. It would be almost impossible for somebody to sit and manually write out 5,000 headlines, for example. Right. But now it's pretty trivial for someone to say, Hey, you know what I want us to do X. I want us to do 5,000 headlines in this tone of voice. Here's a big data set, go train on this data set. And then that allows that that advertiser without having to even work with 
a copywriter and the client and everything else. It's sort of almost like a pre-validated set mm-hmm. of information that they then can go and test rapidly. And having such a wide array of options allows them to mm-hmm. optimize better, to learn, oh, there's a pattern here where every time we mention a percentage off in a promo discount, that beats a flat dollar discount. And mm-hmm. we only figure that mm-hmm. out because we tested 2,500 variations of of ad content or whatever. So it just gives you, you're able to collect more information from the evaluation mm-hmm. side and then iterate on that information more quickly as well. Excellent. And you talked about using a more data-driven approach. Let's go back to the data analysis part of AI. And we know with tools like Data Interpreter from ChatGPT and other tools that AI, generative AI is increasingly able to analyze and evaluate data effectively. So what have you seen as an effective use of this tool for clients? Yeah, for sure. I mean, a very simple example um, would be to do a uh, like a Bayesian time series model. It used to require somebody with a very specialized series of data science knowledge or statistics knowledge and probably a lot of work in Excel or less work, but still a fair amount of work in a, a, a language like Python or R. And so it would require multiple kinds of deeply skilled individuals to be able to get to that type of analysis over the series of many hours. And now there are AI driven systems that can do that in seconds. Even something as simple as ChatGPT and Bard can from Google can both do a causal impact analysis or a Bayesian hierarchy analysis in seconds, as long as you have a structured data set that you can upload and prompt the AI appropriately. And so it kind of democratizes um, more uh, mystique or hidden data science techniques to Mm -hmm. your average marketer or your smaller brand that historically they probably wouldn't want to pay uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to a firm or to a data science specialist to be able to get them those answers. And now they can do it for practically free. Um, And there's more and more applications of that all the time. We're seeing that with audience Mm -hmm. modeling of what type of audience customer is going to be the most valuable for you. We're seeing that with, um, you know, what kind of product is most likely to yield Mm -hmm. a conversion for that individual. So there's many ways in marketing that AI is currently being used, but is very quickly developing around maximizing that ROI uh, from an, from an analysis standpoint. Excellent. Well, this sounds very promising. As we finish up, what do you see as the future of using AI in marketing? Yeah, I think the future will really depend on what time scale you're saying. I'll, I'll keep it mm-hmm. to uh, within the next year or so. Sure. I think it's very likely that you will see a significant consolidation and commoditization of performance marketing paid channels. I think that Mm -hmm. things like Google ads and meta ads and TikTok ads will largely be based on the test design that you do as a smart marketer, as well as Mm -hmm. connecting creative to customers. But all of the actual button pushing and lever pulling in the engines will largely be obsolete, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, I also think that on the generative AI side, we're starting to see early signs of this, but I think it will become a very applicable in the next 12 months is you will have completely artificial influencers and people hmm. who are, uh, you know, avatars of a brand hmm. that are sort of perfectly created using combinations of generative AI and models and things like that, where I could infinitely iterate an influencer who is an icon or an avatar of my hmm. brand to make 10,000 videos a week if hmm. I wanted to. And be able to mimic a human mannerism. So those are the two areas that I think are going to really revolutionize a lot of the marketing ecosystem is less work spending time pushing buttons and less work in or less reliance on um, individual video production and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Ben. This was very helpful. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you check out the show and leave a review. It helps us improve the show and it helps other people discover the show. All right, everyone. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. In the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends.